up boys and girls welcome to my show imperfect murders i'm your host miss doe today we are here to remember a 20 months old baby named charles augustus Lindbergh jr well there were a few articles about this case but um i trust FBI, so the source of this article, of this video, is FBI. <laughs> Charles Augustus Lindbergh, or Lindbergh Jr., 20 months old son of the famous aviator and Anne Merrill Lindbergh, was kidnapped about 9 p.m on march the 1st 1932 from the nursery on the second floor of the Lindbergh home near hopewell new jersey the child's absence was discovered and reported to his parents who were then at home at approximately 10 p.m by the child's nurse betty go a search of the premises was immediately made and a ransom note demanding $50,000 was found on the nursery windowsill. After the Hopwell police were notified, the report was telephoned to the New Jersey State Police who assumed charge of the investigation. Before we keep going, I just want to say that I've got COVID in January. And since then, um, my voice is a little bit shaky, like I can't uh, get my old voice back. And um, it's really hard for me to speak. And sometimes, you know, I get breathless <laughs> while speaking. So I'm so sorry about it. But just know that I know um, my previous videos are bad because of my pronunciation my voice and my emphasizes but emphat i don't even know how to pronounce that word well it's because of co-ed like I, I still have the i still have post co-ed effects after like months shut up <laughs> During the search of the kidnapping scene, traces of mud were found on the floor of the nursery. Footprints, impossible to measure, were found under the nursery window. Two sections of the ladder had been used in reaching the window. One of the two sections was split or broken where it joined the other, indicating that the ladder had broken during the ascent or descent. There were no blood stains in or about the nursery, nor were, were there any fingerprints. Household and estate employees were questioned and investigated. Colonel Lindbergh asked friends to communicate with the kidnappers, and they made widespread appeals for the kidnappers to start negotiations. Various underworld characters were dealt with deals within attempts to contact the kidnappers and numerous clues were advanced and exhausted. A second ransom note was received by Colonel Lindbergh on March the 6th, 1932, postmark Brooklyn, New York, March the 4th, in which the ransom demand was increased to $70,000. A police conference was then called by the governor at Trenton, New Jersey, which was attended by prosecuting officials, police authorities, and government rep representatives. Various theories and policies of procedure were discussed. Private investigators also were employed by Colonel Lindbergh's attorney, Colonel Henry Breckenridge. Uh, the third ransom note was received by Colonel Lindbergh's attorney on March the 8th, informing that an intermediary appointed by the Lindberghs would not be accepted and requesting a note in the newspaper. On the same day, Dr. John F. Condon, 
Bronx, New York City. A retired school principal published in the Bronx Home News and offered to act as go-between and to pay an additional $1,000 ransom. The following day, the fourth ransom note was received by Dr. Condon, which indicated he would be acceptable as a go-between. This was approved by Colonel Lindbergh. About March 10, 1932, Dr. Condon received $70,000 in cash as ransom and immediately started negotiations for payment through newspaper columns using the code name JAFSA. About 8.30 p.m. on March 12th, after receiving an anonymous telephone call, Dr. Condon received a fifth ransom note delivered by Joseph Perron, a taxi cab driver who received it from an unidentified stranger. The message stated that another note would be found beneath a stone at a wake with can stand a hundred feet from an outlying subway station. This note, the sixth, was found by Condon, as indicated. Following instructions, the rain, the doctor met an unidentified man who called himself John at Woodlawn Cemetery near 233, now 233rd Street and Jerome Avenue. They discussed payment of the ransom money. The stranger agreed to furnish a token of the child's identity. Condon was accompanied by a bodyguard except while talking to John. During the next few days, Dr. Condon repeated his advertisements, urging further contact and stating his willingness to pay the ransom. A baby's sleeping suit as a token of identity and a seventh ransom note were received by Dr. Condon on March the 16th. The suite was delivered to Colonel Lindbergh and later identified. Condon continued his advertisements. The eighth ransom note was received by Condon on March the 21st, insisting on complete compliance and advising that the kidnapping had been planned for a year. On March the, March the 29th, Betty Go, the Lindbergh nurse, found the infant's dump guard, worn at the time of the kidnapping, near the entrance to the estate. The following day, the ninth ransom note was received by Condon, threatening to increase the demand to $100,000 and refusing a code for use in newspaper columns. The tenth ransom note, received by Dr. Condon on April 1st, 1932, instructed him to have the money ready the following night, to which Condon replied by an ad in the press. The eleventh ransom note was delivered to Condon on April 2, 1932, by an unidentified taxi driver who said he received it from an unknown man. Dr. Condon found a twelfth ransom note under a stone in front of a greenhouse at 3225 East Tremont Avenue, Bronx, New York, as instructed in the eleventh note. Shortly thereafter, on the same evening, by following the instructions contained in the 12th note, Condon again met whom he believed to be John to reduce the demand to $50,000. This amount was handed to the stranger in exchange for a receipt and a 13th note containing instructions to the effect that the kidnapped child could be found on a boat named Nellie near Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The stranger then walked north into the park woods. The following day, an, un an unsuccessful search for the baby was made near Martha's Vineyard. The search was later repeated. Dr. Condon was positive that he would recognize John if he ever saw him again. On May the 12th, 1932, the body of the kidnapped baby was accidentally found, partly buried and badly decomposed about four and a half miles so southeast of the Lindbergh home, 45 feet from the highway near Montrose, New Jersey, in Mercer, or Mercer County. The discovery was made by William Allen, an assistant on a truck driven by Orville Wilson. 
The head was crushed, there was a hole in the skull, and some of the body members were missing. The body was positively identified and cremated at Trenton, New Jersey on May 13, 1932. The coroner's examination showed that the child had been dead for about two months and that death was caused by a blow on the head. The investigation happened between 1932 and 1934. Now, we'll go into the investigation details. So, we're going back. Um, shh, I'm sorry about my dog. On March the 2nd, 1932, after a conference with the Attorney General, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, Hauer, had contacted the hip headquarters of the New Jersey State Police at Trenton, New Jersey. He officially informed the organization that the U.S. Department of Justice would afford Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf the superintendent of the New Jersey State Police, the assistance and cooperation of the FBI in bringing about the apprehension of the parties responsible for the kidnapping. He advised the New Jersey State Police that they, would, they could call upon the Bureau for any facilities or resources which the latter might be capable of extending. The special agent in charge of the New York City office of the Bureau, which at that time covered the New Jersey district, was instructed accordingly and upon instructions from the director, the special agent in charge communicated with the New Jersey State Police and the New York City Police offering any assistance which the Bureau might be able to lend in this matter. During the next few weeks, the Bureau was acting merely in an auxiliary capacity, there being no federal jurisdiction. However, on May 13, 1932, the President directed that all governmental investigative agencies should place themselves at the disposal of the state of New Jersey and that the FBI should serve as a clearing house and coordinating agency for all investigations in this case conducted by federal investigative, investigative units. On May 23, 1932, the FBI in New York City informed banks in Greater New York that the Bureau was a coordinating agency for all governmental activity in the case. A close watch for ransom money was requested. The New Jersey State Police announced on May 26, 1932, the offer of a reward not to exceed $25,000 for information resulting, resulting in the apprehension and conviction of the kidnapper or kidnappers. In compliance with a request made by Colonel Schwarzkopf, copies of this notice of reward were for, forwarded by the FBI to all law enforcement officials and agencies throughout the United States. On June 10, 1932, Violet Sharp, a waitress in the home of Mrs. Lindbergh's mother, Mrs. Dwight Morrow, who had been under investigation by the authorities, committed suicide by swallowing poison, poison when she was about to be re-questioned. However, her movements on the night of March the 1st, 1932, had been carefully checked and it was soon definitely ascertained that, ascertained that she had no connection with the abduction. Then why did she commit suicide? Maybe she was just too scared or maybe she had something else. She was hiding from the police. I don't know. I don't know, but I wish we knew because, um... Things like this interest me. I love mystery. I love solving mysteries. And I love learning simple things about people. And this is not a simple thing, by the way. The, the reason of a suicide is not a simple thing at all. But, you know, I just love learning what is the favorite color of the person or what is their favorite food, like things like this. So 
um, big things like this, like reason of the suicide, interest me. And if I were a detective, then probably I would be investigating suicides, her suicide, because someone is always guilty from guilty of somebody's suicide well well okay let's let's just keep going in september 1933 president franklin d roosevelt stated in a meeting with director who howard that all work on the case be centralized in the department of justice he requested the director to convey his views to Attorney General Cummings with the suggestion that the Attorney General make a request of the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, either through the President or directly, for a detailed report of all work performed by the IRS Intelligence Unit. On October the 19th, 1933, it was officially announced that the FBI would have exclusive jurisdiction in so far as the federal government was concerned, concerned in the handling of any investigative features of the case. The president's proclamation requiring the return to the treasury of all gold and gold certificates was a valuable aid in the case inasmuch as $40,000 of the ransom money had been paid in gold certificates and, at the time of the proclamation, a large portion of this money was known to be outstanding. Therefore, this phase of the investigation was emphasized. On January the 17th, 1934, a circular letter was issued by the New York City Bureau Office to all banks and their branches in New, in New York City, requesting an extremely close watch for the ransom certificates and, in February 1934, all bureau offices were supplied with copies of the bureau's revised pamphlet containing the serial numbers of ransom bills. The New York City Bureau Office distributed copies of this pamphlet to each employee handling currency in banks, clearing houses, grocery stores in certain selected communities, insurance companies, gasoline, filling stations, airports, department stores, post offices, and telegraph companies. I really hate my voice, like, it's, it's, it's disgusting. Following the distribution of these booklets containing the serial number of the ransom currency, they were also prepared and similarly distributed by the Bureau of Currency K-Cards, which, in convenient form, set forth the inclusive serial numbers of all of the ransom notes which had been paid. This was followed by frequent personal contacts with bank officials and with individual employees in an effort to keep alive their interests. Prior to this time, the passing of ransom bills had been reported to either the FBI, the New Jersey State Police, or the New York City Police Department, none of which had complete information on this point. Therefore, arrangements were effected whereby investigation of all such ransom bills detected in the future could be immediately conducted jointly by representatives of the three interested agencies. One of the byproducts of the case was a mass of misinformation received from well-meaning but uninformed, highly imaginative individuals, and a deluge of letters written by demented persons, publicity seekers, and frauds. It was essential, however, that all possible clues, regardless of the prospect of success, be carefully followed and it was impossible in the vast majority of instances to determine at the inception whether they would be material or false. On March the 4th, 1932, a con man named Gaston B. Means was approached by Mrs. Evelyn Walsh McLean of Washington, D.C., who felt that she might be of material assistance to Colonel Lindbergh in procuring the return of his child. 
Mrs. McLean had become acquainted with Means as a result of some investigative work which Means had performed for her husband some years before. Means informed her that he felt self certain he could secure a contact with the kidnappers inasmuch as he had been invited to participate in a big kidnapping some weeks before but had declined. Means claimed that his friend was responsible for the Lindbergh kidnapping. The following day, Means reported to Mrs. McLean that he had made a contact with the persons who had the child. He successfully induced Mrs. McLean to hand over to him $100,000 to be used in paying the ransom, which she said had been doubled. Until April the 17th, 1932, he kept Mrs. McLean waiting, daily expecting the return of the child. During this period, he purported to be effecting negotia negotiations with the alleged leader of the kidnappers, whom he called the Fox. Mrs. McLean finally requested the return of the $100,000 and additional money which she had advanced him for expenses. When he failed to do so, the case was turned over to the FBI. Means and the Fox, who was found to be Norman T. Whitaker, a disbarred Washington attorney, were apprehended, and Means was later convicted of embezzlement and larceny after trust and sentenced to serve 15 years in a federal penitentiary. Whitaker or Whitaker and Means were later convicted of conspiracy to defraud and were sentenced to serve two years each in a federal penitentiary. There were other attempted frauds which required extensive in investigations before they could be completely eliminated from consideration in connection with the Lindbergh case. In all, there were literally thousands of leads in all sections of the United States which were followed to their definite conclusions by the Bureau. The results of all these investigations, no matter how trivial, were reported. The activities of the known and suspected members of the so-called Purple Gang of Detroit and various rumors and allegations concerning this gang were carefully and thoroughly investigated. Numerous registries of votes were examined in a fruitless endeavor to locate the boat Nelly, on which the baby was to have been found according to the 13th and last ransom note handed to Dr. Condon at the time he paid the ransom money to John. Records of cemetery employees who were employed in various cemeteries in certain sections of New York City and near Hopewell, New Jersey, were examined. Information accumulated in various other kidnapping and extortion cases handled by the FBI was examined in closest detail and studied with particular reference to any bearing they might have upon the solution of the Lindbergh case. Hundreds of photographs and descriptive data of known criminals of all types and other possible suspects were exhibit exhibited. To the few eyewitnesses in this case, in an endeavor to identify the mysterious John. On May 2, 1933, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York discovered $296.10 gold certificates and $120 gold certificate, all in Berg ransom notes. These bills were included among the currency received at the Federal Reserve Bank on May 1, 1933 and apparently had been made in one deposit. Immediately upon the discovery of these bills, deposit tickets at the Federal Reserve Bank for May 1, 1933 were examined. One was found bearing the name and address of J.J. Faulkner, 537 West, 149th Street and had marked the Rion Gold certificates $10 and $20 in the amount of $2,980. I hate numbers. I hate them. Despite extensive investigation, this depositor was never located.
it's so hot like it's it's really hot and and I'm sweating like a pig and I can't speak I'm 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 so sad today I'm so sad Examination of the ransom notes by handwriting experts resulted in a ritually unanimous, unanimous opinion that all the notes were written by the same person and that the writer was of German nationality but had spent some time in America. Dr. Conan described John as Scandinavian and believing he could identify the men spent considerable time in weaving the numerous photographs of possible suspects and known criminals. In this connection, the FBI retained the services of an artist to prepare a portrait of John from descriptions furnished by Dr. Conan and Joseph Perron, the taxi cab driver who had delivered one of the ransom letters to Dr. Condon. In a further endeavor to endeavor... What is this word? Wait... Wait. Endeavor. Did you hear that? Endeavor. Endeavor. Okay. In a further endeavor to identify the individual who received the <laughs> ransom payment, representatives of the New York City Bureau Office engaged Dr. Conan to prepare a transcript of all conversations had by him with John on March the 12th and April the 2nd, 1932, the dates on which Dr. Conan personally contacted the kidnapper in order to negotiate the return of the child and the payment of the ransom. These conversations were during March 1934, transcribed in detail on pho phonograph records by Dr. Conan, who imitated the pronunciations and dialect of John. In this manner, the nationality, education, mentality, and character of the kidnapper were more clearly defined and permanently preserved for future use. Another interesting attempt to identify the kidnapper centered around the letter used in the crime. Police quickly realized that it was crudely built, but built nonetheless by someone familiar with wood who was mechanically inclined. The latter had been thoroughly examined for fingerprints and had been exhibited to builders, carpenters, and neighbors of the Lingbergs in Wayne. Slivers of the letter, or slivers of the letter, even had been analyzed, and the types of wood used in the letter had been identified. Perhaps a complete examination of the letter by itself by a wood expert would yield additional clues. And in early 1933, such an expert was called in. Arthur Collar of the Forest Service, United States Department of Agriculture. Collar disassembled the letter and painstakingly identified the types of wood used in examined tool marks. He also looked at the pattern made by nail holes, for it appeared likely that some wood had been used before in indoor construction. Collar made field trips to the Lindbergh estate and to factories to trace some of the wood. He summarized it, his findings in a report and later played a critical role in the trial of the kidnapper. For a period of seven months prior to August 20, 1934, no gold certificates was, were discovered except for those received in the Federal Reserve Bank previously mentioned. Starting on at August the 20th, 1934, and extending into September, a total of 16 gold certificates were discovered, most of them in the vicinity of Yorkville and Harlem. The long-awaited opportunity had finally arrived. As each bill was recovered, a colored pin marking the location of the recovered bill was inserted in a large map of the metropolitan area, thus indicating the movements of the individual or individuals who might be passing the ransom money. When the first few made their appear appearance, it was decided to concentrate on gold certificates. As experience had proven, the futility of tracing the ordinary currency included in the ransom money. 
In keeping with the cooperative policy previously established with the New Jersey State Police and New York City Police Department, teams composed of a representative of each of these police agencies and a special agent of the Bureau were organized to personally contact all banks in Greater New York and Westchester County. As a result, the various neighborhood banks discovered the bills close to the point at which they were passed and it then became possible for the investigators to trace the bills to the person who had originally passed them. For the first time in the history of the case, the investigators succeeded in finding that the description of the individual passing these bills fit exactly that of John as described by Dr. Condon. It was determined through the investigation that the bills were being passed principally at corner produce stores. About 1.30 p.m. on September 18, 1934, the assistant manager of the Corn Exchange Bank and Trust, Trust Company at 125th Street and Park Avenue, New York City, telephoned the New York City Bureau Office to advise that a $10 gold certificate had been discovered a few minutes previously by one of the tellers in that bank. It was soon ascertained that this bill had been received at the bank from a gasoline station located at 127th Street and Lexington Avenue, New York City. On September 15, 1934, an alert attendant had received a bill in payment for five gallons of gasoline from a man whose description fitted closely that of the individual who had passed other bills in recent weeks. The filling station attendant, being suspicious of the $10 gold certificate, recorded on the bill the license number of the automobile driven by the purchaser. This license number was issued to Bruno Richard Hauptmann, 1279 East 222nd Street, Bronx, New York. Why am I still here? Why am I still trying? I have no idea. I have no idea. Hauptmann's house was closely sur surveilled by federal and local authorities throughout the night of September the 18th, 1934, until at approximately 9 a.m. on September the 19th, 19. 34. An individual closely fitting the description of John as supplied by, do by Dr. Condon and the description of the pur purchaser of the gasoline as supplied by the service station attendant left his house and entered his automobile parked nearby. He was promptly taken into custody by representatives of the three interested agencies. After some investigating, he was found to be Bruno Richard Hauptmann, the individual to whom the automobile license had been issued, a German carpenter who had been in this country for approximately 11 years. A $20 gold ransom certificate was found on his person. His description fitted perfectly that of John as described by Dr. Condon and in his house was found a pair of shoes which had been purchased with a $20 ransom bill recovered on September the 8th, 1934. Houtman admitted several other purchases which had been made with ransom certificates. On the night of September the 19th, 1934, he was positively identified by Joseph Perron as the individual from whom he had received the fifth ransom note to be delivered to Dr. Conan. The following day, the ransom certificates in excess of $13,000 were found secreted in the garage of Hauptmann's residence. Shortly thereafter, he was identified by Dr. Conan as John to whom the ransom had been paid. It was also ascertained that he was in possession of a Dodge sedan automobile, which answered the description of that seen in the vicinity of the Lindbergh home the day prior to the kidnapping. Shortly after his apprehension, specimens of Houtman's handwriting were flown to Washington, D.C., where a study was made of them in the FBI laboratory. 
a comparison of the writing appearing on the ransom notes with that of the specimens disclosed remarkable remarkable similarities in inconspicuous personal characteristics and writing habits which resulted in a positive identification by the handwriting experts of the laboratory upon the apprehension of Houtman, it was found that he bore a striking resemblance to the portrait of john which had previously been prepared from descriptions furnished by dr conan and joseph perron further investigation developed that Houtman, 35 years old was a native of saxony germany he had a criminal record for robbery and spent time in prison. Early in July 1923, he stowed away aboard the SS Hanover at Bremen, Germany, and arrived in the port of New York City on July 13, 1923. He was arrested and deported immediately. After another failed attempt and entry in August, Hauptmann successfully entered the United States in November 1923 on board the George Washington. On October 10, 1925, Hauptmann married Emma Schaffler, a New York City waitress. A son, Man Fry, was born to them in 1933. During his illegal stay in New York City and until the spring of 1932, Hauptmann followed his occupation of carpenter. However, a short while after March 1, 1932, the date of the kidnapping, Hauptmann began to trade rather extensively in stocks and never worked again. Hauptmann was indicted in the Supreme Court, Bronx County, New York, on charges of extortion on September 26, 1934 and on October 8, 1934 in Hunterdon County, New Jersey. He was indicted for murder. Two days later, the governor of the state of New York honored the requ requisition of the governor of the state of New, Jer New Jersey <coughs> for the surrender of Bruno Richard Hopman and on October the 19th, 1934, he was removed to the Hunter Dunk County Jail, Flemington, New Jersey, to await trial. This is not me. This is not my voice. I, I. Oh my God! Help me! What can I do to get my old voice back? I, I really loved my voice. I was, you know, doing voice acting, and with this voice, I'm sure that I will never be able to do any voice act. Okay, the trial of. Hauptmann began on January the 3rd, 1935, at Flemington, New Jersey, and lasted five weeks. The case against him was based on circumstantial evidence. Tool marks on the letter matched tools owned by Hauptmann. Wood in the letter was found to match wood he used as flooring in his attic. Dr. Connell's telephone number and address were found scrawled on a door frame inside a closet. Handwriting on the ransom notes matched samples of Hauptmann's handwriting. On February 13, 1935, the jury returned a verdict. Hauptmann was guilty of murder in the first degree. The sentence? Death. The defense appealed. The Supreme Court of the State of New Jersey on October 9, 1935, upheld the verdict of the lower court. Hauptmann's appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States was denied on December 9, 1935, and he was to be electrocuted on January 17, 1936. However, on the same day, the governor of the state of New Jersey granted a 30-day reprieve, and on February 17, 1936, Hauptmann was resentenced to be electrocuted during the week of March 30, 1936. On March the 30th, 1936, the pardon court of the state of New Jersey denied Hauptmann's petition for clemency and on April the 3rd, 1936, at 8.47 p.m., Bruno Richard Hauptmann was electrocuted. Well, if you are an old subscriber of mine or if you watched any of my 
previous videos, you'd know that death is not a punishment in my dictionary. Um, it's like, it's like a salvation, like, I, we don't know, it, I'm not sure if I should be saying this, but we don't know if there is a judge there. We, we can never be sure. And if there is not, then the person who was killed won't get any like punishment at all it will be a salvation they will just you know i don't know how to explain this but whenever um What is the word? Well, whenever the killer dies at the end of the case, I became I become a little bit sad because I'm really sad for those people and their killers just die. And death is not a punishment, death is good. Being that is good, you know? And I just don't know what to say. I just know that. I feel like they should be here for a long time. They should be living with what they did. Or they can give them to us, to the public, and we'll do will do what it takes, you know, you know, well, I'm talking about myself, I don't think I can torture someone, but, um, if somebody tortures a killer at the street, I, w I wouldn't be bothered, I wouldn't be bothered, that, that would be nice, that would be nice, that's a punishment, yeah, that's a punishment, death is not a punishment, even though you believe in God, well, I do believe in God, because I want a judge there, I want somebody to judge objectively, and give the right punishment to whom... deserves I, I can't speak English but I'm not native I'm, I'm trying though I'm trying please don't don't hate me and yeah yeah that that's my thoughts that's just my thoughts and knowing that there is no specific reason for the death of Charles makes me even sadder because he was just a baby he was just 20 months old 20 months old. I'm saying this one more time. 20 months old. Was kidnapped for ransom. And I was killed. That's a shitty end. Right? Well, I have no words. I have no words. I'm out of words. That's it. That's it. If you can. Have a life full of stars. Till then.